All right, what's the name of the Torah portion? A keb, you see, right there. What's that first letter on the right? Ayin, and then what? Kuf, and then the bait or vet. And what does a keb mean? <clears throat> it means because, but it can also mean if. <clears throat> so, for example, Deuteronomy 7.12, it will come to pass if you hearken to these ordinances or because you hearken to these ordinances and you keep and you do them, then what happens? The Lord, your God, will keep with you the covenant and the mercy he swore to your fathers. Uh, reminds me, <clears throat> a lot of people think the Old Testament was just law and the New Testament is just mercy. Wrong. Law and mercy was all through the Old Covenant. Law and mercy is all through the New Covenant. They go together. Can you imagine living in a lawless society? The whole thing is just unfathomable. Well, now look at Genesis 3.15. Back then, God was talking to Adam and Eve, and he said, I will put enmity between, he's speaking to the serpent, between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed, it will bruise your head and you will bruise his heel. Okay, well, guess what the Hebrew word for heel is? Watch this. Heel is akev. Ekev is because they're if, akev is heel. So it's, it's the same word pronounced differently. Now, look at Genesis 25, 26, referring to the birth of Jacob and Esau, or Esau and Jacob. It says, and after that came his brother out, and his hand took hold on Esau's akev, his heel. And his name was called Akov. Okay, so here's what you have. You have the word because, akev, the heel, akev, and if you put the letter yud, okay, in front of it, you get Yaakov or Jacob. So there is akev, akev, akov. Okay, and it's all tied together, and the letter yud is a picture of what? I'm giving you a hint. <laughs> good, good, good. Hand. So the letter U is a hand, and Yaakov grabbed his heel with his hand. So he's known as the heel grabber. Okay, so now you kind of get an idea of Ekev, Akev, Akov. Now, wait till you see what happens. As you know, our heels are the lowest part of our body. It is our heels that hit the ground first. When we get out of bed, when we start walking. So clearly, our heels, despite their lowly status, have an essential role to perform in the overall maintenance of our physical well-being. If you can't walk, that kind of hinders your well-being. And this is the source of God's blessing when he bestows equally upon each and every one of us who walk in all of his ways. The first thing you do to get up out of bed is to start walking. And if you walk in his ways, you're going to be blessed. Now, look at Luke 10, verse 19. It says, Behold, I give you power to walk, tread on serpents and scorpions. Okay, so here's some serpents and scorpions. And what do they attack? Your heel. That's what they attack. And it says you'll have power over the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Okay. And we know from Genesis, Satan wants to bruise your heel. Satan's whole goal is to ruin your walk with God. But if your heel belongs to God and you walk in his ways, you're safe. That's what it's all about. Now, when it talks about serpents and scorpions, let's look at Ezekiel 
chapter 2, 3 through 6. You know, I love letting the Bible interpret itself rather than letting me try to come up with some theological meaning. It says, he said to me, son of man, I'm sending you to the children of Israel, to an uncontrolled nation which has gone against me. They and their fathers have been sinners against me even to this very day. The children are hard and stiff-hearted. I'm sending you to them, and you are to say to them, these are the words of the Lord. And they, if they give ear to you, or if they do not give ear, for they are an uncontrolled people, will see there has been a prophet among them. And you, son of man, have no fear of them or their words, even if sharp thorns are around you and you are living among what? Scorpions. Serpents and scorpions represent those who are opposed to God and the walk. Okay, and it says, have no fear of their words. Don't be overcome by their looks, for they are an uncontrolled people. Okay, so he says, don't be afraid of their what? Words. Our fight is always with words. It's the word of God against the enemy's word. And the word represents Yeshua. We're to walk in his way. It makes it so simple when we find out. Now, they just said you're living among scorpions. Now, look at Matthew 23, 33. Yeshua says, you serpents, you generation of vipers, how can you escape the damnation of hell? So when he's talking about serpents and scorpions he's, who want to attack your heel, he's talking about those who want to attack your walk with God. Doesn't that make it a lot more sense rather than trying to think and now you can hold serpents and shake them around during the service? I mean, this is really stupid. Okay. Now, watch this. Malachi 4. One through four. Behold, the days are coming, burning like an oven, when all the arrogant and all the evildoers will be stubble. The day that is coming will set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will leave them neither root nor branch. But for you who do what? Fear my name, the Son of Righteousness will rise with healing in not its wings, his wings. And when it says the Son of Righteousness, will rise with healing in his wings. That refers to the Messiah. The wings are the seat seat, which is why the woman who had the issue of blood knew he would be the Messiah if she grabbed his seat seat and she would be healed, which is why he said, your faith has made you whole. She knew he was the Messiah. But then look what it says. You shall tread down the wicked, for they will be ashes under the soles of your feet. This is what it's been talking about. On the day when I act, says Lord of hosts, but what's the key? Remember the Torah of my servant Moses, the statutes, the rules I commanded him at or Horeb or Sinai for all of Israel. Wow. The whole key to the end times, it says, is remembering the Torah. Her seed will be stomping on the serpent's head and the serpent will be attacking the heel of her seed, which is why in Revelation, I believe 14, the serpent goes after her seed. Well, guess what? The words of the Torah are our weapons. That's the, the words of the Torah. That, what did Yeshua fight with when the devil tempted him in the wilderness? That is our weapon, which is why this Roman soldier costume is the stupidest thing I've ever seen, okay, when it comes putting on the armor of God. It's not, we're not fighting in the flesh. We're fighting in the spirit. Well, look at Revelation 12, verse 15 through 17. The serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood and the earth helped the woman. The earth opened her mouth, swallowed up the flood which the dragon cast out of his mouth. The dragon was angry with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed. They are the ones who keep the commandments of God, and they have the testimony of Yeshua. Many have the testimony of Yeshua, but don't keep the commandments. Many have the commandments, but don't keep the testimony of Yeshua. What Satan doesn't like is people that have both. Okay, so let's look at Luke 12, 34 through 39. Where your treasure is, that's where your heart will be. 
So let your loins be girded about, your lights burning, and be like men that wait for the Lord when he does what? What? Here are believers who don't make it to the wedding. They don't make it to the wedding. They have to wait for him to return from the wedding. Isn't that interesting? And this time, when he knocks, they open immediately. Blessed are those servants whom the Lord, when he comes, will find watching. I say to you, then he shall gird himself, have them sit down to eat, and will come forth and serve them. What this is saying, there are some believers who won't make it to the wedding, but they get to make it to the wedding supper. Fascinating. And then it says, if he comes in the second or third watch and find them watching, blessed are those servants, and this know, if the good man of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not have suffered his house to be broken through. So there are some believers who don't know when to watch, what to watch for, and they are going to suffer because of that. They still make it to the wedding supper, but not to the wedding because they aren't on God's calendar. Okay, now, again, look at Malachi 4, 5. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord come. Okay, and what is he going to do? Tell everyone to return to the Torah. Now, here's what's amazing. You know, in Exodus 20, 17, uh, Exodus 20, verses 2 through 17, it goes through the 10 words or the 10 commandments. Guess what? In that section of the 10 commandments, there are 172 Hebrew words. 172 Hebrew words. And when you add up the letters of a cab, you get 172. So your heel if you obey my commandments, equals the 172 Hebrew words in the commandments. Are you following me? The Hebrew word for heel, the ayin is 70, the kuf is 100, the bait is 2, is 172, and it so happens there are exactly 172 Hebrew words in the commandments between verse 2 and 17. See, I mean, only God can make these kind of connections that tell you if you're healed, if you're walking in his commandments, it will be well with you and you will be safe. Isn't that amazing how that works? Now, look at Deuteronomy 8.1. This is very important. Uh, it's different in different translations, but it says the whole commandment. Okay, some say commandments, plural, but it's one commandment that has a whole bunch of commandments, but it's one whole commandment. And what does that mean? You can't tear it apart. If, if it, it's like tearing apart anything, a quilt or whatever, the threads, no. It's one whole commandment that I command you today, then you'll be careful what to do that you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land that the Lord swore to give to your fathers. Now, look at the next verses, two and three. God says, I want you to remember the way which the Lord your God has led you these 40 years in the wilderness that you might, and the purpose was that he could humble you, prove you. He wanted to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. He humbled you. He allowed you to be hungry, and then he fed you with manna, which you'd never seen before. Neither did your fathers know why that he might make you know <clears throat> that man does not live by bread only, but man lives by everything that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord. Yeah. What he speaks is our food, his word. His word is the manna. Yeshua is the word. He's the manna that came down from heaven. All right. Now, the Torah, remember, where did the Torah come from? The mouth of God. Not from Moses. Moses was the scribe. How would Moses know what happened 2,000 years earlier? How would he know what Noah said? Okay? So the Torah is the only words that proceeded out of the mouth of God. All the rest of the Bible, which is inspired, was inspired through visions or something like that, 
Only the Torah comes directly from the mouth of God, and the Torah is also likened to bread. Okay, so God was testing them. Do they prefer a life of freedom with their basic needs being met, or do they prefer having every aspect of their life controlled by the Egyptian government receiving their monthly stipend of leeks and onions? Is anyone hearing me? Do we, do we want freedom or do we want to depend on the government for everything? With the government, with, they're trying to make a monthly stipend be given to everybody. So everyone depends on the government. All right. <clears throat> I believe we need to bless the Lord. Uh, how many of you know uh, within Judaism... I mean, they pray for before the meal, but God says, I also want you to pray after the meal when they're satisfied and full, because when do we forsake God? After we're satisfied and full. Look at Solomon. Okay. But I think we also need to thank God when we just had some real good spiritual meal. That is just as important. And that's why, uh, let's see, Deuteronomy 8, 6 through 8. It says, therefore, you shall keep the commandments of the Lord your God to walk in his ways, to fear him, for the Lord your God is going to bring you into a good land with brooks of water, fountains, and depths that spring out of valleys and hills, a land of wheat and barley, vines, fig trees, pomegranates, a land of oil, olive, and honey. Now, the honey here is referred to the nectar that is squeezed from dates, not bee honey. This is date honey, and they've got thousands of dates in Israel, but this isn't bee honey. <clears throat> but you also have the seven species it talks about in Israel. And then here it is in Deuteronomy 8.10. Our Torah portion is the verse. So when you have eaten and are full, then you shall bless the Lord your God for the good land which he has given you. So let's look at verses 11 through 18. It says, beware that you forget not the Lord your God. How? How do you forget the Lord? By not keeping his commandments, his judgments, and statutes, which I command you this day, lest when you have eaten and are full. I mentioned this the other week with Solomon. You built goodly houses and you live there. Your herds and your flocks multiply. Your silver and your gold is multiplied. All that you have is multiplied, and then your heart is lifted up, and you forget the Lord your God. See, it's when we're completely blessed. We don't think we need him. We don't even thank him for how we're blessed. And he's the one, it says, who brought you out of Egypt from the house of bondage. He's the one who led you through that great and terrible wilderness wherein were what? serpents and scorpions that I was talking about earlier. And right now, for the last several thousand years also, and even today, we are going through the wilderness and we are encountering serpents and scorpions which attack our heel because it affects our walk. And it says, drought and there was no water and water, the word of God is also likened to water. And when there's no water, you end up having a famine, a drought. All right? Now, he's the one who brought the water out of a rock, who fed you in the wilderness with manna, which your fathers did not know. And again, the reason is, to humble you that he might prove you to do you good at your latter end. And you said in your heart, my power and the might of my hand is what has gotten me all this wealth. What do we see today? Everyone thinks it's their power, their mighty hand that got them the wealth that they have. And God's going to take it all away. It says, you shall remember the Lord your God because he's the one that gives you the power to get the wealth so he can establish his covenant, which is for to your fathers as it is this day. In one sense, prosperity, and a lot of churches are preaching the prosperity doctrine. 
will become a new temptation that they've never experienced. They never were prosperous. They were slaves in Egypt. They had nothing. And now all of a sudden they end up getting blessed abundantly and then they forget God. They don't acknowledge that he's the one who gave them this stuff. This is why, I don't know for me, I mean, everyone likes to have nice things or whatever, but I see possessions as things that come and go. And uh, I don't put my trust in possessions that come and go. I put my trust in him. You know, I mean, I, how many of you know it's really all about relationships? Look at these wealthy people. I, I, I can't remember, Ben Affleck and someone else. Billions of millions of dollars, and then they get divorced, and it's all gone. Why? Because it's not about the money. It's never about the money. Sometimes we think it's about the money, and we do everything we can, but the relationship is what's important. Oh, my gosh, I'd rather have peace and quiet with no money than a lot of money and turmoil and trouble. Okay. Deuteronomy 9, 4 through 6. Do not speak in your heart after the Lord your God has cast them out from before you, saying, well, it's because of my righteousness the Lord has brought me in to possess this land. No, it's for the wickedness of these nations the Lord does drive them out before you. It's not for your righteousness or for the uprightness of your heart that you go in to possess the land. It's because of the wickedness of these nations. The Lord your God drives them out from before you, that he may perform the word which the Lord swore to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Understand, therefore, that the Lord your God gives you not this good land to possess it for your righteousness, because you're a bunch of stiff-necked people. And it goes on to say, and if you don't obey, I'll kick you out too. Matter of fact, the land will throw you up. So let's look at 10, 12, and 13. It says, and now, Israel, what does the Lord require of you? Oh, wow, here's them tough commandments. Wow, this is hard to obey, these commandments. <gasps> what is it? To fear the Lord your God. Oh, that's tough. Walk in all of his ways, to love them, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul and to keep the commandments of the Lord and the statutes which I command you this day for your good. Oh, wow, that just sounds too tough for me. I, man, I got to love you? Oh, it's ridiculous. <laughs> wow. What, where do you put the things you treasure? In a safe, a vault, your will. I mean, you put different things. You make sure the things you treasure are what? Safe. Look at Isaiah 33, verse 5 and 6. You will see the Lord also has a safe. The Lord has a vault. It says, the Lord is exalted for he dwells on high. He will fill Zion with justice and righteousness. He will be the stability of your times. Abundance of salvation, wisdom, and knowledge. The fear of the Lord is Zion's treasure. Wow. We can become his treasure and put in his safe. Look at Deuteronomy 28, 12. And then the Lord will open to you his good treasury, the heavens, to give the rain to your land in its season, to bless all the work of your hands, and you will lend to many nations, but you shall not borrow. Wow. And then back to our Torah portion. Look at Deuteronomy 10, 17, and 18. For the Lord your God is God of gods, Lord of lords, the great, the mighty, the awesome God, who is not partial and takes no bribe. He executes justice for the fatherless, the widow, and he loves the sojourner, giving him food and clothing. Wow, you can have all the money in the world, but you can't bribe God. You know why? God creates the gold and the silver. He doesn't need your money. What's interesting, I don't know how many of you have heard of Rabbi Jonathan Sachs out of London who died just pretty recently. Uh, he made a statement, uh, and he said that God's greatness, as we're reading here, 
okay, the God of gods, Lord of lords, the great, the mighty, the awesome God is followed by his humility. The greatness of God is followed by his humility to teach us that these two traits have to go hand in hand. You can't be great. You will never be great without being humble, without first considering those less fortunate or those who may otherwise be forgotten. Think about it. He says how great he is, and then it says he makes sure the fatherless, the widow are taken care of, not the great and mighty human beings. I think that is amazing how this shows the great and mighty God takes care of the fatherless, the widow. I mean, if we want to be like him, that's what we need to do. Now, look at Deuteronomy 11, 10 through 12. God says, for the land that you go in to possess is not as the land from Egypt, from where you came out, where you sowed your seed, watered it with your foot. What does that mean? Water it with your foot. That means you had to go down to the Nile, get buckets of water, walk back and water your field, walking back and forth, carrying buckets of water. He says, oh no, he says, the land where you're going to possess is a land of hills and valleys. It drinks water from the rain of heaven. You don't have to water it by your hand or by your foot. And it's a land which the Lord your God cares for. The eyes of the Lord your God are always on it from the beginning of the year even to the end of the year. All right. But what happens if they don't obey? No rain. You know what that means? It means there is climate change, but it's God-directed. <laughs> Bible t- talks all about climate change. You get rain if you obey, and you don't get rain if you don't obey. Isn't that amazing how that works? Okay, Deuteronomy 11, 13 through 17. If you will indeed obey my commandments that I command you today, to love the Lord your God, to serve him with all your heart, with all your soul, he will give you rain for your land in its season, an early rain, a latter rain, that you may gather in your grain and your wine and your oil. He will even give grass in your fields for your livestock. You'll eat and be full, but take care lest your heart gets deceived and you turn aside and serve other gods and worship them. Then what happens? Then the anger of the Lord will be kindled against you and he will shut up the heavens so there will be no rain and the land will yield no fruit and you will perish quickly off the good land that the Lord is giving you. Climate change is real, but God controls it. The number of cows in the field does not control climate change. Okay, let's look at Deuteronomy 11, 22 through 25. If you will be careful to do all this commandment that I command you today, loving the Lord your God, using your heel, your feet to walk in all of his ways and you hold fast, then the Lord will drive out all these nations before you and you will dispossess nations greater and mightier than you. Now look at this. Every place on which the sole of your foot tread shall be yours. It goes back to your feet. It goes back to your walk. Will you obey or not obey? Your territory will be from the wilderness to the Lebanon. Did you know Israel's original land was part of Lebanon? Joshua conquered all the way up into Lebanon. And from the river, the river Euphrates, okay, which is going through Iraq. I mean, this was a huge area to the Western Sea. That's the Mediterranean. No one shall be able to stand against you. The Lord your God will lay the fear of you and the dread of you on all the land that you will tread as he promised you. The only way we can tread and make a difference where we tread is if we're keeping his commandments. Now, I'm going to show you something else here. I got this nice little pathway on the screen. This is going to be mind-blowing. How many of you know Yeshua, the Torah is written, but Yeshua is alive. So Yeshua is the written Torah come to life. You following me? I will prove that. 
Look at John 14, 4 through 6. He says to his disciples, where I go, you know, and you know the way. And Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? And Yeshua said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So what is Yeshua? The way, the truth, and the life. <gasps> well, look at Psalm 119.1. Blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law or the Torah of the Lord. What? The Torah is the way, it says. The law is the way, and Yeshua is the way. Look at Psalm 119, 142. Your righteousness is an everlasting righteousness, and your law or Torah is the truth. What? Yeshua says, I'm the truth, and Yeshua also said his Torah is the truth. And what about life? Look at Proverbs 13, 14. The law or the Torah of the wise is a fountain of life to depart from the snares of death. So the Torah is the way, the truth, and the life. And Yeshua is the way, the truth, and the life. It's amazing how that connects. Now, concerning the Hoff Torah portion, we know these uh, are the weeks of consolation and comfort. Look at Isaiah 51, 1 through 4. It says, listen to me, you that follow after righteousness, you that seek the Lord. Look to the rock from where you are hewn or cut out of. The rock. Remember the vision in Daniel where there's this big rock and a piece of rock is cut out from it and destroys uh, the figure? Remember that story? Well, how many of you know, how many of you were raised Catholic? Who was the rock? Peter. But that's wrong. Look what this says. Look to the rock from where you are hewn and to the hole of the pit from where you are dug. Look to who? Abraham is the rock. Now, we know Yeshua is the ultimate rock, but Abraham was rocky. And he says, look to Abraham, your father, and to Sarah that bore you, for I called him alone, blessed him, increased him. And it says, the Lord will comfort Zion. He will comfort her waste places. He will make her wilderness like Eden, her desert like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness will be found there. Thanksgiving and the voice of melody. Then he says here again, listen. And we know the Hebrew word for listen is what? It small means more than listen. It means to hear and obey. Look at this. Listen to me, my people. Give ear to me, O my nation, for what? A law is going to proceed from me, and I will make my judgment to rest for a light to the people. We know the Torah is Oh my gosh, look at Proverbs 6.23. For the commandment is a lamp and the Torah is light. And we're not to hide the light under the bushel. The light's not you. The light is the Torah, which means all of the good things you're doing and you're giving glory to God, not to yourself. That's the key. Okay, let's stand. Oh, let me show you two more slides here. Oh, the, this one here is just God has engraven us on the palm of his hands. And Torah is a light. I love my little Torah light I made. Yay. Okay, now we can stand. Avinu Mokenu, our Father King, we just thank you so much for shining the light of the Torah on us so we would know just how dark we were living. Father, we don't want to return to the darkness. We want to stay in the light. And I just thank you so much for all those that are here locally in the United States, around the world, that want to magnify the Torah, make it honorable once again. We thank you for all those who uh, tithe or donate into your ministry here, Father, because that's what we truly want to do. We want to reach the world for you and light up this dark world. In Yeshua's name, amen. Together, blessed are you, Lord our God, creator and king of the universe. You have blessed us with your Torah of truth. You have blessed us with the whole counsel of your living word by the power of your Holy Spirit through the completed work of Messiah Yeshua. You alone have planted among us life eternal. Blessed are you, Lord our God. Amen. Take a break. Now, 
I believe this book has been so mistaught. Of course, there's many levels of meaning, and I'm just going to show you the level at which I think it should be taught at. I've laid, a, I think, a pretty good foundation. Now, Solomon is not the greatest guy in the world. Okay. One of the things that uh, people don't know is really what this book is called. Actually, there's different renderings. It can be the Song of Songs, which is to Solomon. It could be the Song of Songs, which is for Solomon. It could be the Song of Songs, which is about Solomon. They don't, Solomon didn't necessarily write this. That's what you have to understand. A lot of people think it's the Song of Solomon. It's not the Song of Solomon. It's a song to Solomon, for Solomon, about Solomon. That's what's important to remember. Now, uh, so Song of Songs 1-1, one, one, I have the Song of Songs, which is Solomon's, but I definitely don't believe it is by Solomon. Now, <clears throat> the best way to understand this book is to think of it as a play, okay? So, let's open the curtains. Dun, dun, dun. This is a dramatic play, and it's going to be in six different acts. And so, what do we have? The first act, and you can write this down, is chapter 1, verse 2, through chapter 2, verse 7. And we see that the Shulamite, or the bride-to-be, is double-minded. She can't decide where she wants to go. Does she want a human king like Solomon, or does she want the shepherd to be her king? And, as we know, God never sleeps or slumbers. And you're going to find the bride continually falling asleep, which is represented of the body of believers <laughs> and Israel as well. Okay, act two is going to begin in chapter two, verse eight, and it goes chapter three, verse five. And here we have the shepherd calling the bride to wake up, and we find she does, and then she falls asleep again. And then in act three, which is chapter three, verse six through five, Two, her search begins looking for the shepherd, and she falls asleep again. And then, Act 4, which is chapter 5, verse 3, through chapter 6, verse 10, we see a true repentance. It's not a self-centered repentance. We know there's false repentance and true repentance. And now she has a real heartfelt search for the shepherd. And then that brings us to Act 5, which is chapter 6, verse 11 through chapter 8, verse 4, where she finally works the harvest and she falls asleep again. But this time she falls asleep, not from depression or whatever, she falls asleep because she's been working so hard. Then the last act and the final act, 6, is chapter 8, verse 5, through chapter 8, verse 14. And here, she finally has a concern for others than herself, okay? And she has ears to hear what is going on. Now, the next thing we want to do is we have to know who the cast of characters are in the Song of Songs. So here are the cast of characters. We have King Solomon and his entourage, okay, they're the ones that are surrounding him, protecting him. So King Solomon is in the play. Then we also have the shepherd and the Shulamite, okay? Here's the shepherd. Oh, not that one, that one. <laughs> so we got the shepherd and the Shulamite, as well as her family. Then we also have not only the Shulamite's family, but we also have all the daughters of Jerusalem, who Solomon loves. Okay, so now look at 
Ezekiel 34, verse 31. Now, as you know, God's goal has always been to reach everybody, and everyone's in a different place. That's why sometimes we're considered sheep. Sometimes we're considered fish. Sometimes, I mean, we have all daughters, brides. I mean, we have, you know, sons. But the whole purpose of that is God's trying to reach everyone in a different place. Well, in Ezekiel 34, 31, God says to us, and you, my sheep, the sheep of my pasture are humans, and I'm your God, says the Lord God. Did you know God was known as Israel's shepherd long before he was known as their king? Isn't that amazing? Israel related to God as the shepherd, not as the king. Look at Psalms 80, verse 1. It says, Give ear, O shepherd of Israel, you that lead Joseph like a flock, you that dwell between the cherubim, shine forth. So here, even King David recognized God as his shepherd, which is why we all know from Psalms 23, verse 1 through 3, the Lord is my what? Shepherd, I won't want. He's the one who makes me to lie down in green pastures. He's the one who leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness, not for our sake, for his name's sake. So everyone will know he's the great shepherd. But clear back many, 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 about a thousand years earlier in Genesis 49, when Jacob or Israel is blessing his kids, he had this to say about Joseph in Genesis 49, verse 24. His bow abode in strength, and the arms of his hands were made strong by the hands of the mighty God of Jacob. From thence is the shepherd, the stone of Israel. So even Jacob, long before Moses, 400 years, called God the shepherd and the rock of Israel. So God was known as the shepherd long before he was known as the king. But we also know God always wanted his shepherds to feed the flock. But most have been fleecing the flock. Look at Ezekiel 34, verse 2. He tells Ezekiel, son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, thus says the Lord God to the shepherds, woe be to the shepherds of Israel that do feed themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flocks? Do you remember in John 21, three times, what did Yeshua tell Peter? Feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. That has always consistently been God's goal. Now, we know God wanted his shepherds to feed the sheep, not fleece the sheep. And uh, it was not for the shepherds to rule over his sheep. Okay? He claimed that that's what the Gentiles do to their people. The Gentiles rule or harsh toward their sheep. So God is looking for humble people who will serve him and love his people. Do you remember what God told Nathan concerning David wanting to build a house for God? What did he say? He says, you can't build a house for me. You got bloody hands. Look at 1 Chronicles 17, 4 through 7. He said, go and tell David, my servant, so says the Lord, you are not going to build me a house to dwell in, for I have not dwelt in a house since the day I brought Israel up until today. I've gone from tent to tent. From one tabernacle to another, wherever I've walked with all of Israel, did I ever ask any of the judges whom I commanded to do what? That's what he's commanded them, to feed my people. And he never said, well, how come you haven't built me a house of cedars? And so now tell this to my servant David. So says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep, so that you should be ruler over my people Israel. God wanted a shepherd to rule over his people. Here is David. David was a shepherd who always took care of the sheep. But guess what? Solomon was not a shepherd. He was born with a silver spoon in his mouth. 
He had everything. He never had to experience what David experienced. Now, <clears throat> what you're going to find here, I mean, Solomon uh, wasn't ever trained as a shepherd, never had the heart of a shepherd. And so in the Song of Songs, what you're going to be seeing as we study it is a battle going on between King Solomon and Messiah, the shepherd, and you're going to see the bride trying to decide, does she want to follow a human king or does she want to follow God as her shepherd king? That's what the whole book is about. Yes, it's about a groom and a bride, but it's a bigger picture is Israel wanted a human king and got God so upset. He said, I gave you a king in my anger, in my wrath, I took him away. He was to be their king. And so uh, what's interesting is the Shulamite has to face a choice between King Solomon, who isn't a shepherd, and a shepherd who wants her only to voluntarily join his kingdom because as a king, this shepherd is a melech. He only accepts voluntary subjects. He cannot force the bride to love him. So he has to woo her, romance her, whatever he can do to get her to come back to him. All right? So um, look at Hosea 13.10. This is the verse I just quoted. It's God is speaking to Israel, and he says, Where now is your king, that he may save you in all your cities? And where are your judges of whom you said, Give me a king and princes. And God says, look, I gave you a king in my anger and I've taken him away in my wrath. Look at 1 Samuel. Well, look at when this happened. This is chapter 8, verse 5 through 9. God had the people of Israel tell Samuel they want a king. They don't want God to be their king. And it says, and I said to him, behold, you are old. This is what they said to Samuel. And your sons aren't walking in your ways, so make us a king to judge us like all the nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, give us a king to judge us. And so Samuel prays to the Lord, and the Lord says to Samuel, listen to the voice of the people in all that they say to you, because they've not rejected me, they have rejected me. So here they are rejecting God as their king. He says that I should not reign over them. According to all the works as they've done since the day I brought them out of Egypt, even to this day wherewith they have forsaken me, served other gods, now they're doing that to you. Therefore, hearken to their voice, howbeit protest solemnly to them and show them the manner of the king that will reign over them. Okay, I mean, God is so humble. I mean, if I was God, I'd say, fine, smash them, give them a king, you know. But God said, oh my goodness, because I'm a Malek. They voluntarily can leave, but I want you to protest. Let them know what's going to happen if they do. And so look at 1 Samuel 8, 15. He's saying, look, they're going to tax you. They're going to take a tenth of your seed, of your vineyards, and give it to his officers and his servants. Wow, how many of you want a government to rule over you? Look at 8, 19, and 20. Nevertheless, the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel and they said, no, we want a king over us that we also may be like all the nations that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. Okay, so what the Song of Songs is about, here's the plot. I believe it is a very prophetic story of the Messiah wooing his bride away from wanting an earthly king back to himself as their king. But you're going to see the bride at the beginning is totally self-centered. This whole book is about the maturity of the bride. At first, she doesn't even want to work the harvest. She doesn't want to feed the sheep. She just wants to enjoy the blessings. And then she finally fulfills her calling in being one with the shepherd, and together they work the harvest. That's the good news at the end. So King Solomon now is enticing the Shulamite with everything the world has to offer and wants her to stay with him. She even pursues her in the wilderness, trying to get to her while she's going to the shepherd. Okay, and what is happening, the Shulamite is being pulled with those cords of love by the shepherd who wants to be her king. Now, there's no way in this story King Solomon and the shepherd can be the same person. 
which is where everyone's been confused, and you're going to see why. If you look at Song of Songs 1, verse 4, the second half, she goes, the king has brought me into his chambers. She knows who the king is. It's King Solomon. And she knows what he does for a living. He's bossy, all right? But here, look at just a few short verses later in verse 7. She says, tell me whom my soul loves. Where do you feed? Where do you make your flock to rest at noon? Why should I be as one that turns aside by the flocks of your companion? So she's talking to someone who she knows absolutely nothing about. But she also claims to love him. Well, how many believers today claim to love the Lord and they know nothing about him? <clears throat> it's the same. A lot of them don't even know he's Jewish. <clears throat> now, let's see. One of the keys to also understanding this is knowing, and you can make marks in your Bible if you believe in making marks in your Bible, who's talking. You have to know who's talking. That's a huge difference. Okay. <clears throat> now, here's the other thing to know who's talking. The bridegroom always refers to the bride as my love. She always refers to him as my beloved. It's that, that it really helps because there are some mistranslations, believe it or not, in the English in this book that we'll go over. Now, look at Song of Songs, chapter 5, verse 4. It says, my beloved. So who's talking? Her. My beloved put his hand by the latch of the door and my heart yearned for him. That tells you how he always refers to her as my love. Look at Song of Songs, chapter 4, verse 1. Behold, you are fair, my love. You are fair. You have dove's eyes behind your veil. So do you see that? That's how you know who's talking. And then we also see the daughters of Jerusalem are involved. But look at Song of Songs, chapter 2, verse 10. She says, my beloved spoke and said to me. So you know that's her. And in verse 10, the second half, what did he say? Rise up, my love. So who's talking? He is. And he says, rise up. That means who was sleeping? She was. See how simple that is. Okay. <clears throat> it's so important to understand this. And I think what's interesting, when we begin the book here in just a minute, it begins with the bride doing all the talking. Yeah, that kind of tells you there's a problem here. You know, we're supposed to hear and obey, not tell him what to do. But oftentimes, when we first come to the Messiah, it's gimme, 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 do this, do this, do this. And we don't know how to be quiet before the king and see what he asks of us. Okay. Um, okay, let's begin. Are you ready? Song of Songs, chapter 1. And let's look at verse 1 through Four. It says, let him, so who's talking? She is. Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. She says, for your love is better than wine because of the savor of your good ointments. Your name is as ointment poured forth. Therefore, do the virgins love you. Now, notice, I find it very interesting. It doesn't say, therefore, I love you. She doesn't claim to love him out of either embarrassment or I don't know what the motive is, but she says, but the virgins love you. And then she says, oh, but pick me, pick me, draw me. And then she says, we will run after you, not I will run after you. She wants to be part of the group. And she says, we will run after you. And then all of a sudden, the king has brought me into his chambers. It doesn't say you have brought me into the king's chambers. It says, uh oh, the king just showed up and he took me into his chambers. And then she goes back and she's speaking to the shepherd. But we will be glad and rejoice in you. It doesn't say him. It's not talking about the king. It says, we're, we're going to rejoice in you. We will remember your love more than wine. The upright loved you. Again, not I love you. 
but all who are upright love you. And what do we see in Ecclesiastes 7.1? A good name is better than precious ointment, which is what it says. Your name is as ointment poured forth. Look at Jeremiah 31.3. The Lord has appeared of old to me saying, yes, I've loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, well, with loving kindness, I've drawn you. Solomon never showed loving kindness. The shepherd is showing loving kindness. And here, I think it's interesting, you know, how wonderful his name is. Well, look at Psalm 119, 132. Look upon me and be merciful to me as your custom is toward those who, what? Love your name. Psalm 66, 2. Sing out the honor of his name. Make his praise glorious. Well, the shepherd has a glorious name. There's healing in his name. And what do we know? The bride takes on the name of her husband. Well, look at this in Jeremiah 33, verse 16. In those days, Judah shall be saved. Jerusalem shall dwell safely. And this is the name wherewith she will be called. She'll be called the Lord our righteousness. We take on his name. Look at Isaiah 4, 1 and 2. In that day, there will be seven women who are going to take hold of one man, and they say, we will eat our own food and water, wear our own apparel, only let us be called by your name to take away our reproach. And that day, the branch of the Lord shall be beautiful and glorious, and the fruit of the earth will be excellent and appealing for those of Israel who have escaped. Okay, we're going to take upon the name of the Lord now. How many know Messiah is the branch? Messiah is the branch. Well, I believe the bride wants her reproach of desiring an earthly king to be taken away. As she returns to the Lord and takes on his name. Look at Hosea chapter 11, verse 1 through 4. When Israel was a child, I loved him. Out of Egypt, I called my son as they called them, so they went from them. They sacrificed to the Baals. They burned incense to carved images. I taught Ephraim to walk. Think about walking in his ways. He taught Ephraim to walk, taking them by their arms. But they didn't know that I'm the one who healed them. I drew them with gentle cords, with bands of love. And I was to them as those who take the yoke from their neck. I stooped and I fed them. And guess what? They rebelled against me. And he's the one who truly loved them. <clears throat> so now, let's watch what happens at verse 5 and 6. She is speaking, okay, the Shulamite. And <clears throat> she says, I am black. Oh, but comely, oh, you daughters of Jerusalem. So now she's not speaking to the shepherds. She's speaking to the daughters of Jerusalem. And she says, as the tents of Kadar, as the curtains of Solomon. And then she says, don't look at me because I am black, because the sun has looked upon me. My mother's children were angry with me. They may be the keeper of the vineyards, but my own vineyard I have not kept. Wow. And now look at verse, well, let me show you the slide. Here we're going to see, here is Solomon's chamber up there. This is like an old castle. And this is King Solomon's castle. Daughters of Jerusalem, welcome. Come. All right. And so here it's a stormy castle. And all of a sudden, what do we see? King Solomon's castle, daughters of Jerusalem, welcome. And then here are the tents of Kedar, which always were very black. But what she's speaking about is her moral condition. She says, the sun has looked upon me. Israel was always involved with sun worship. This is what that is talking about. Look at 2 Kings 23, 11. He took away, this is Josiah, took away the horses that the kings of Judah had given to the sun at the entering in of the house of the Lord by the chamber of Nathan Melech, the chamberlain, 
which was in the suburbs, and they even burned the chariots of the sun with fire. So this whole thing, when she's saying, I am black, she's talking about her moral condition by worshiping all of the sun, the stars, the moons, the planets. This is what it is talking about. And we see, finally, 500 years after Solomon, they were still worshiping the sun, okay? And it took Josiah to put a stop to it. Now, look at chapter 1, verse 7. She is speaking to the shepherd, and she says, Tell me, O you whom my soul loves, where you feed, where you make your flocks to rest at noon, why should I be as one that turns aside by the flocks of your companions? You ever look at that? Here she claims to love him, but knows nothing about him. So this cannot be Solomon. And then she wants to come when the flocks are resting at lunchtime so she can have lunch and not do any work. Look at that. And then she has the gall to say, and if you don't tell me, I just may go to someone else. Look at it. That's what it says. I just might turn aside if you don't tell me. Okay, so let's go back to the Solomon's chamber. Okay. And it's lightning. And here she pops out of the castle saying, oh, someone help save me from King Solomon. And so what happens? She goes, ooh, that shepherd boy's cute. (laughs) And and she goes, I love you so much. By the way, uh, what's your name? (laughs) Where do you work? How can I contact you? Uh, What's your schedule? (laughs) And, And so what do we find? It's the daughters of Jerusalem who tell her, In verse 8, well, if you don't know, oh, fairest among women, why don't you go forth by the footsteps of the flock and feed your kids beside the shepherd's tent? If you don't know, why don't you get to work and go follow the footsteps of the sheep? And what's interesting to me, we find in Luke 16, verse 8, that the children of this world are in their generation wiser than the children of light. Here she's the bride, supposedly, but everyone else knows all about the shepherd. And hey, if you don't know, why don't you go follow the footsteps of the flock? Now, there's a big question that you're going to see here is, who are the daughters of Jerusalem? What does it mean to be a daughter of Jerusalem? So where do we go to find out? The Bible. Instead of me telling you who they are, let the Bible tell you who they are. Uh, Basically, what you're going to find, the daughters of a city are the new little towns that are produced out of that city. That's what it is. The daughters of Jerusalem are the new little surrounding cities that are built. Let's watch. In Ezekiel 16, again, the word of the Lord came to be saying, Son of man, cause Jerusalem to know her abominations and say, thus says the Lord God to Jerusalem, <clears throat> your birth and your nativity are from the land of Canaan. Your father was an Amorite and your mother was a Hittite. If you remember, when Abraham was there, okay, it was controlled by the Hittites, the Amorites. Jerusalem was known as Jebus earlier, It was the mother, look at this, it tells you who the mother was, who the father was. Okay, so we see the father was an Amorite and her mother was a Hittite. They are the ones who founded the city of Jerusalem. So if you remember, before Jerusalem was named Jerusalem by King David, it was known as Jebus. This is where the Jebusites lived. Going back a thousand years before David to the time of Abraham, we find in the story about Melchizedek, Jerusalem was known then as Salem. It was Salem and then became Jebus and then became Jerusalem. And Jerusalem was initially ruled by the Canaanites. Uh, We see the initial founders were an Amorite and a Hittite. Now, look at this, Ezekiel 16 and verse 45. You, 
speaking to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, or your mother's daughter. In other words, you're just like the Amorites or the Hittites. And it says, loathing husband and children, and you are the sister of your sisters. Wow, there's not only daughters, there's sisters who loathe their husbands and children. Again, your mother was a terrorist. That's what Hittite means. And your father an Amorite. Now look at this map here. Okay, so here is Jerusalem. She has two sisters. One of her sisters is Samaria. Her other sister is Sodom. Look at what it says. Your elder sister, that who was founded first before Jerusalem, Samaria was founded, who dwells with her daughters to the north of you. Her daughters are cities around Samaria. And your younger sister, which means Sodom, that city was created after Jerusalem, to the south is Sodom and her daughters. That's the city surrounding Sodom. Okay, from this we see Jerusalem's sisters are Samaria to the north and Sodom to the south. Is everyone following? Okay, so as we begin to look through the Song of Songs, I just wanted to kind of give you a basis, the plot of the story, and understand the daughters of Jerusalem are going to be the suburbs around her. The suburbs around Samaria are the daughters of Samaria. The suburbs around Sodom are the suburbs around Sodom. And the daughters of Jerusalem are the little cities, towns, that are just outside and surrounding Jerusalem, okay? But here's what's amazing. Solomon doesn't love Jerusalem. Solomon's love is for the daughters of Jerusalem. The shepherd loves Jerusalem. Do you see the difference here? And when you understand the overarching meaning of this story, it will all make sense. All right, let's stand.